Hey everyone, this is Alex from WarnOffKeys.com, and in this video, I'm going to show you the basics of web scraping using the NPM packages Puppeteer and Cheerio. If you ever need help when following one of my videos, you can simply scroll to the description and join the community Discord server. From there, simply click on how to ask for help in the opening channel, and then follow the instructions on how to ask your questions. Also, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future tutorials. So Puppeteer is going to basically run a Chrome browser for us. So this is how we're going to actually get the HTML of the website. Now, how do we actually use that HTML effectively? Well, that's where Cheerio comes in. And this has a jQuery-like syntax that allows us to access certain HTML elements from the resulting HTML. So within this video, I'm going to show you how you can screenshot websites how you can gather certain pieces of text from websites, and how you can traverse the DOM of those websites by using Cheerio. To get started, I'm in an empty VS Code folder, and I'm inside my console here using Commander. However, you can use whatever console you choose. I'm going to start off by initializing an npm project with npm init-y. The dash y will automatically accept all of the default questions, and that gives us our package.json file. I'm then going to create a new index.js file. And going back into our console, we now have to install those two dependencies. So I can say npm install puppeteer and then a space Cheerio. So now that those are installed, we can go inside of our JavaScript file and we can start off by just importing puppeteer. We'll deal with Cheerio later on. So I can say const puppeteer equals require. Puppeteer. We then need to have an asynchronous function. So we can create our own asynchronous function and then call that, or we can use something called an iffy, which stands for an immediately invoked function expression. This is basically just an encapsulated function that is immediately ran. So to do this, we first have to create some parentheses and then a function inside. And outside of those parentheses, we can add in a function call. Now this function should be asynchronous because we're looking to use the await keyword. So we can simply add asynchronous before the parameters. Now within here, we can add in our await keyword and this anonymous error function is going to automatically be invoked because of these ending parentheses here. So the first step is to actually launch a Puppeteer browser. I can say const browser equals await puppeteer dot launch. Now there's different things we can do here, but we want to also make sure that we close the browser. So before we write the rest of the code, at the end of our code, let's make sure that we don't forget this and we can say await browser dot close. Now in between these two things is where we're going to add in our logic to actually go to the website and screenshot it or gather the HTML or whatever we need to do. So to do that, we have to create something called a page, which is pretty self-explanatory. I can say const page equals await browser dot new page. This is going to generate a new page for us, and we can then use this page to navigate to a website. For example, I can say await page dot go to. We can then add in a URL such as https google.com. And this would then navigate our browser to Google. Now, if I ran this, we wouldn't see anything because again, by default, Puppeteer launches as a headless version, which means we don't actually see the window. But to ensure this works, let's go ahead and try and screenshot the website. We can say await page dot screenshot parentheses, and we can pass in an object with a path property here. I'm just going to name this image.png. And if I save this and going into my terminal, I can use control L to clear it. I can then run it with node index.js. This might take a couple of seconds depending on your internet connection. But after it's done, we now see this image.png here. If I click on it, we now see Google. Now we can actually change the size of the viewport or basically the size of the Chrome browser that this thing is going to mimic. That way we can get a mobile view if we wanted, or we can get a larger view. To do that, 
we can go inside of the launch function call and add in an object here. There's a number of different properties that we can add into this. We're not going to dive into all of them within this video, but the ones we don't cover will be covered in the official documentation, which you can find on NPM. So within here, we can add in a default viewport object. We can then specify a width, for example, 500, and then a height, for example, 900. If I save this and I run the program again, it then took another screenshot. And if I open this, it's now going to have 500 width and 900 height. So going back, you can just simply change the width and height of the actual window you want. One other option you have as a launch parameter property is to say headless is false. So if I save this and I run it, we should now see a Chromium browser open, which is what we see right here. It's then going to take a screenshot and then it's going to close due to line 19. So if we wanted to keep this around, there are ways to do that and you can visibly see things with headless false. This is useful if you're doing end-to-end -end testing, which is where you're basically automating the testing to see how everything works. And if you want to watch that process, you can use this property here. However, when I'm usually using Puppeteer, I'm usually trying to automate it so I can do things on my computer as well. So I usually have headless true, which is default. So of course we can just remove this within the properties. So now let's take a look at how we can get the actual HTML of this web page. So scrolling down after we take a screenshot, I can say const HTML equals await page dot evaluate. And this is going to have its own function as a parameter. Now within here, we have access to the document object. We also can return things back into our HTML constant. So I can return an object. Let's say width is going to be document dot document element dot client width. And then we also have height, which is document dot document element dot client height. So this obviously isn't the HTML, but we'll get to that soon. Here we can go ahead and console log the HTML. And if I save this and run it, we now see this object where the width is 500 and the height is 900, which of course makes sense because that's our default viewport. So if I remove this, we're going to see something different. I can go ahead and save this. And if I run it again, we now see 800 by 600, which is the default viewport built into Puppeteer. Now, one thing to keep in mind when using Evaluate is that this is going to be running within the instance of the Chromium browser. So anything you add in here will be ran as if it was ran in that browser. This console log statement on line 22 actually printed out to our console. But if I add in a console log here that said, hello world, if I save this and run it, we're not going to see it in our console, but it will be displayed inside the actual Chromium browser's console, which obviously we don't see because headless mode is set to true. So if you're trying to add in any console logs to gather more information, it will not work whenever you're inside of Evaluate. So now let's go ahead and actually return the HTML. I'm going to remove this console log and within this returned object, I'm going to add an HTML, which would be document.documentElement.innerHTML. I can then save this. And if we run this, we're going to see an object with all the HTML and then the width and then the height. So here we see the end of this object with the expected width and height. And we also see a bunch of HTML, which is not really readable within the console. However, this now proves that we have access to it. So we can then use the Cheerio package to go through and parse through it and gain any information we need. Now scraping Google is useful and it could be useful to gather results of search queries. However, to make things easier, we're gonna go ahead and try and find a price of an Amazon product. So I found the best product for the job, which is this giant enter button. We can go ahead and try and get access to the price on this page. And in theory, this could be used to track the price over time. But for now, we're just going to try and retrieve this. We're not going to get too crazy or too complicated. To start off, we need to know what element we need to target. And on any website you're trying to track things on, you can right click and go to inspect. And we then see the exact element right here that has the price. 
Now, keep in mind that in some cases, such as on the worn off keys website, there's going to be dynamically generated elements, or rather dynamically generated IDs and classes. So if I go ahead and inspect this, we are going to see these random characters at the end. And this makes it much more difficult to scrape pieces of information from the website. There are ways to get around it, but you have to get really creative with how you scrape things. For now, we're going to use Amazon as an example, because this right here, this ID is not randomly generated. That means it's going to be easier to use as an example to gather information about this product. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this URL. Anything past the question mark is actually not required. So here we see a question mark. Everything past that will be different query parameters. That will be basically just additional information that Amazon uses to track us. We don't need that information. So if I press enter, we still see the same product. So I'm going to click here and copy the URL. Going back, I'm then going to paste it in here. And I'm going to run this just to make sure that it actually screenshots the website correctly. So I'm going to open up the image and here we see the actual button right here. So that's working so far. Let's go back to our main file. We now want to use Cheerio. So we have to import it. Const Cheerio equals require Cheerio. So now that we've imported that, we can scroll down and we can load all of the HTML, which we loaded from right here into Cheerio, and it's going to act very similarly to jQuery. So similar to jQuery, I'm going to name my variable a dollar sign and set this equal to Cheerio dot load, and then pass in HTML dot HTML. And actually this variable name is not properly named for what it does. So I'm going to press F2 and rename this to page data. It'll then rename it in all other places here. I can get rid of this console log. We don't need it right now. But here we have this dollar sign, which is going to allow us to basically use jQuery queries on this HTML document. So going back over to Amazon, we see that we're selecting the price element right here. And this is the ID price block underscore R price. So if I double click on that, I can use control C or command C to copy it. We can then go back and we can say dollar sign parentheses string. This is an ID. So we use a hash symbol and this. We can now say const element equals this. And we now have access to that element. So now we can go ahead and console log this with console.log element dot text, which is a function that Cheerio offers similar to jQuery, where it's going to retrieve the text of that element that's displayed to the user. So if I save this, we can now run this here. And we see dollar sign fourteen ninety nine, which is exactly what we see on the Amazon website right here. So I encourage you to go ahead and try to scrape other websites, try and see what information you can gather. Be aware that certain websites don't like to be scraped. If you're just testing it as a one off thing, they're not going to notice or care probably. But just be aware if you do this on a large scale, you could get in trouble depending on who you're scraping because it's using their resources and gathering data that they may not want. In an exact case like this with Amazon, you may want to look to see if there's an Amazon API rather than scraping data directly like this. This is obviously just an example though, and so it works fine for this video. If you want to see more tutorials like this one, consider subscribing. And if my videos have helped you out, please consider clicking on the join button below this video to become a channel member. Thanks for watching.